Good evening, brethren. This service tonight is strictly for brethren, those who are baptized, members of the body of Christ, which is the church of God. Tonight is the time for the second Passover, and tonight's service represents a solemn memorial for those who are eligible to take the Passover and who have examined themselves in preparation for it, but who, because of situating circumstances, were not able to attend the Passover during the first month in God's calendar. The story of the observance of a second Passover is found in Second Chronicles 30. It describes a time that goes back to the first year of the reign of King Hezekiah. God instructed Moses regarding the necessity of keeping a second Passover. Starting in Numbers 9, verse 9, we read, And the Eternal spoke to Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If any man of you or your posterity shall be unclean by reason of a dead body or be in a journey afar off, yet he shall keep the Passover unto the Lord, verse 11, the fourteenth day of the second month at even, they shall keep it. Christ changed the, the way in which the Passover is kept, but the principle of keeping it is so important to one's salvation that God not only provided a second Passover for those who, because of extenuating circumstances such as illness, etc., were not able to attend the first Passover, but he requires that we keep the second Passover if we were not able to keep the first Passover, lest, as a consequence, we be cut off from him and from his first fruit. This Passover memorial, I am going to play for you scripture used by Herbert W. Armstrong in the last Passover memorial that he conducted in Pasadena, California before he died. And we've divided it into sections with pauses in between. So you will have time to do the foot washing in the beginning section before the introduction to the breaking and eating of the bread begins. Then there will be a pause during which you take the bread and then the next section will introduce the drinking of the wine and then there will be a pause while you take it. You take a glass and consume the wine. Following that last pause, the traditional reading from the Bible will begin. During each pause, there will be a countdown clock on your screen so you'll know exactly when Mr. Armstrong will be back to begin the next section. You should have set up the room in which you will observe the Passover before ahead of time. It should be very neat and clean, and you should have a towel and small wash basin and a couple of cups of warm water for each person participating in the foot washing. You should also have a small amount of unleavened bread and very small glasses of wine, one for each person with no more than a tablespoon of wine in each small glass. Prepared on a tray or table and these should be covered with an immaculate. This service is a very sobering occasion because you are reflecting on the suffering and the death of Jesus Christ. It is also a most encouraging service because it reveals the love of God for His people. We are given this annual reminder of the glorious victory over sin that is ours because of the sacrifice of the only begotten Son of God. There will be prayers within the service over the bread and the wine, but the service which Mr. Armstrong will begin in about five minutes. 
will begin without prayer. Those of you who participate in this service are expressing your faith in Christ's death on your behalf, and you are renewing your commitment to let Christ live his life in you. No unconverted, unbaptized children should participate. There should be no visiting, talking, laughing, joking, or conversation. You are meeting on the most solemn and serious occasion of the entire year. Your approach should be one of great reverence. The remainder of this service will be conducted by Herbert W. Armstrong, whom you will see next in exactly five minutes.
This is the most solemn ceremony or service of the year, my 55th Passover. I'm quite sure that that must be a little larger number than any of you have. God ordained the Passover forever when the children of Israel were in Egypt thousands of years ago now. But at Jesus' last Passover that he observed during his earthly ministry, we read that then came the day of unleavened bread, when the Passover must be killed. Now the day of unleavened bread actually is the day that had arrived at sunset that night was the preparation day for getting leaven out of the home preceding the seven days of unleavened bread. It of itself was not one of the days of unleavened bread, but the day on which all leaven should be put out. And he said to Peter and John, Go and prepare us the Passover that we may eat. And when the hour was come, he sat down, and the twelve apostles with him, and he said unto them, With desire have I desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you that I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God, indicating that we will continue the Passover in the kingdom of God after the coming of Christ. Now Jesus changed the symbols of the Passover from eating the roast body of a lamb after its blood had been shed and the lamb had been killed to the bread and the wine. So that we read now in Matthew 26, And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. So that the broken bread represented his broken body broken for us. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink hereafter or henceforth of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung in him, they went out into the Mount of Olives. Of course, there... Jesus talked with him a while. He went apart and prayed. He almost weakened when he realized what was going to happen and that the hour had come and the time of the day had come and he had to face it now. That lasted on through the night. He was taken into various places and tried by the government officials and by the Jewish officials and was condemned to death. Now in John 13, And supper being ended, the devil having now put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that his father had given all things unto his hand, and that he was come from God and went to God, he rises from supper. It had been a supper when they ate roast lamb up to this time. This was the last supper. Now Jesus wants to change it from eating a meal into merely the bread and the wine, which we shall take here tonight. He rises up from supper, laid aside his garments, took a towel, and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? And Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. Peter said unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not only not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit. And ye are clean, but not all. For he knew who should betray him. Therefore said he, you are not all clean. So after he had washed their feet and had taken his garments and was set down again, he said unto them, Know ye what I have done to you? You call me Master and Lord, and ye say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. The washing of their feet was an act of humility. In those days, they wore open sandals. The roads were dusty. They probably didn't have cement sidewalks to walk on. A servant 
would take off their slippers or their sandals when they came in at the door of a house and would wash their feet, after which they would probably put on other sandals that were there waiting and clean for them. In other words, the host would always have some extra sandals for guests to wear. They still do something like that in Japan. I've gone into homes in Japan where I had to take off my shoes and put on slippers of some kind that were there at the home for guests to use when they came into the house. But it is an act of humility. And he was their Lord and Master, and he stooped to do, do this to them. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If you know these things, happy are ye if you do them. So now at this time, we will leave and have the foot washing service. And I think you know you all know just where to go. And there should be no conversation, no talking, but quietly go and then return as quickly as possible.
Brethren, this is a three-minute warning that you've got three minutes to finish the foot washing before the next section of tonight's Passover memorial, second Passover memorial, begins again. If you're finished and you're waiting, you might want to be reading from John beginning in chapter 13 on through John 17 while you're quietly waiting for the next section. Okay, there's a half a minute to go before Mr. Armstrong resumes with the next section, with the breaking of the bread. Read now from the 11th chapter of the Apostle Paul's letter to the Corinthians, beginning with verse 23. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it, and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, this do for the remission of sins. After the same manner also he took the cup, when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament of my blood, this do ye as often as you do it in remembrance of me. Therefore, it is a memorial. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily, referring only to the manner in which you do it, shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let every man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread, and drink of that cup. For he that eateth, and drinketh unworthily, in the manner in which he does it, eateth and drinketh damnation, or judgment, unto himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, not discerning the Lord's body, that it was broken for us, for our physical healing. His blood was shed for the remission of our spiritual sins. His body was broken for the healing of our physical sins or whatever has happened to cause illness, sickness, or suffering. Now from John 6 and verse 53. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat of the flesh of the Son of Man and drink of his blood, you have no life in you. 
I might just explain in that regard that we do not have life until we receive the Spirit of God. We have a material chemical existence. It is not life in the spiritual sense at all. As you read in 2 Corinthians, the first two chapters, that ye were dead in trespasses and sin. As a matter of fact, Adam and Eve did not have life. They were created with a chemical existence. Before them was the tree of life, and they could have had life, but they made the wrong choice and took to themselves the knowledge of what is right and what is wrong, or of good and evil, of deciding for themselves what is sin. They did not receive life. God has decreed that as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive in a resurrection to judgment. Judgment has begun already at the church of God, but judgment has not begun as yet on the world. Judgment will begin on the world of all of those who survive and are still living after Christ comes when the world is ruled by the kingdom of God and the government of God. Judgment is not a process of condemning, but a trial as to whether you receive life or death. In other words, we might say it is an opportunity to receive life. I think there has been so much misunderstanding on that very vital point. The world is not yet judged. Everyone who has ever been born will be judged in his own due time. But there are three resurrections yet to come mentioned in the Bible. The first resurrection will be those who have been judged to have received life. I hope that includes all who are in this room. That will be at the coming of Christ. The second resurrection will be the resurrection to judgment, the great white throne judgment mentioned in the 20th chapter of Revelation. The third resurrection will occur after that judgment which may last a hundred years, which may last a very short time. God knows one passage of scripture indicates it could be a hundred years. That scripture can be translated in two different ways, and another way of translating it, it would not refer to a hundred year lifespan in that resurrection. So we just cannot know that. However, the last resurrection will be a resurrection of those who have been judged whose eyes have been opened, who have known the truth, who have rejected God and rejected Christ and Christ's sacrifice for them and God's gift of eternal life, and who have been judged guilty. They will die in the lake of fire, which will burn them up. Not a hell fire that burns and burns and never burns up. Chemically, such a thing would be impossible. Yet millions have believed it. The world has been very greatly deceived. We must have the bread served next. At this point, we'll have the bread. Please bow your head for the prayer. Almighty God in heaven, we pause now to ask you a blessing on this broken bread, representing the broken body of Jesus Christ, broken for our healing. Father, help us all to take it worthily. Help us to have faith and to believe. We're in a time of trouble when apparently Satan has come down after the battle with Michael in heaven and is persecuting the church in every way possible. Our only defense is the shield of faith in the armor of God. Father in heaven, help us to understand that we don't work up faith ourselves, that faith is the gift of God, that it comes through your Holy Spirit and that you give it when we are totally surrendered to you. It's not our faith, it is Jesus' faith given to us. The same faith he used to walk on the water, the same faith he used to heal the sick, to perform miracles, to cast out demons. Father, I ask you to give all in this room that faith, a faith that many of us have never had. Open our minds to receive it in the name of Jesus and bless this bread to that purpose as we partake of it in Jesus' name. Amen.
Please bow your head as we have the prayer over the wine. Jesus said for all of them to drink of it, that this is the New Testament of his blood shed for the remission of sins. Help us to understand, Father, that this merely is a memorial representing, a symbol representing the blood of Christ. And our taking it means our receiving again the blood of Christ for the remission of our sins. God is the lawgiver, God the Father. Our sins cut us off from God the Father. And when Jesus paid the penalty in our stead, that simply reconciles us to God the Father. And God has eternal life to give. However, the life comes through the resurrection of Christ rather than through his death. And it comes through our resurrection, ultimately. And I hope for God's church at the second coming of Christ, for judgment is on us now. So Almighty God, bless this wine as we take it and help us to realize the significance, the meaning of it, that we are once again affirming by taking it that we are accepting the blood of Christ for the remission of our sins and to reconcile us to God. And that means that we have repented because we have no right, we cannot accept his blood unless we have repented. And to repent means to turn away from sin, that we will not commit those sins, whatever they may be, again at least that we will strive mightily never to again, and that we ask God's help. He said of the church that if we sin, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and not only us, but the rest of the world too. So bless everyone in this room, Father, as they partake of this. Help us to realize the real deep significance of it and the meaning of it as we take it. We ask your blessing on it in Jesus' name. Amen. the 13th chapter, beginning with verse 31. Therefore, when Judas had gone out, Jesus said, A new commandment I give you, that you love one another, as I have loved you, that you love one another. Most people would not understand how that could be a new commandment. You'll find it quoted way back in the Old Testament. It is new because anything new never becomes old. It is a spiritual commandment and spiritual things never become old. They're continually new. Therefore, it is still a new commandment and always will be. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one to another. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself 
that where I am, there you may be also. He will come in clouds. He will receive those who have at that time God's Holy Spirit, whether dead or living. The dead shall rise first. We which are alive will be changed instantaneously from mortal to immortal and caught up to meet him in the air. But we are merely going to meet him as he is coming back here. For his feet will rest that same day on the Mount of Olives, and he's going to remain here for the next thousand years. And where he is, that is where we shall be also. Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, dwelling in him by the Spirit, the same as the Father can dwell in us by his Holy Spirit, he doeth the works. Jesus is the Word of God. He does not speak of just his own will alone. He speaks the will of the Father, but his will and the Father's will are one. They are united. Two cannot walk together except they be agreed. So says God. God the Father and Jesus Christ have been walking together for trillions and centrillions of years because they are totally agreed and always will be. May we be agreed with them. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the work that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. He said it was expedient for them that he go away. If they did not go to the Father, the Holy Spirit would not come, but if he went to the Father, he would send the Holy Spirit. We could not do such works without the Holy Spirit. That is why it was expedient for us that he go away. He is in heaven, has been alive these 1950 years, and incidentally, it is 1950 years ago to the day that Jesus died. One century of time cycles plus 50. That is rather significant that it happens to be at exactly that time in this day. He did not die at this time of day, but it was the same day. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. But you can't ask in his name unless if you ask in the power, you might say the power of attorney, of having his authority to do it. And you cannot ask something that is contrary to the will of God and expect that he will perform it. If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, meaning the Holy Spirit, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. At the time Jesus spoke that, the Holy Spirit was dwelling with them in the person of Jesus, but was not in them yet, not until the day of Pentecost after his resurrection. So he was dwelling with them in the Holy Spirit through Christ and was later and on the day of Pentecost to be within them. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. And Christ does come through the Holy Spirit. Jesus answered and said, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Reminds me of something that you will read in the first chapter of First John, that our fellowship is with God the Father and with Christ, as well as with one another. Fellowship is a very, very important thing, and our fellowship is not only with one another, it is also with God the Father and with Jesus Christ his Son. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Now coming to chapter 15. I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, the father takes away, as the vine dresser. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it that it may bring forth more fruit. In other words, God corrects and chastens, even punishes every son whom he loves. God's punishment is never revenge. God's punishment is never making us pay the penalty of what we did. God's punishment is always corrective, to correct us and to get us back on the track and to help us. God's punishment is always given in love, 
Many people do not understand what Jesus meant when he said to pray for your enemies. Pray for them that despitefully use you. I pray for all such by praying that God will bless them by dealing with them in the way that he knows is for their good. Now sometimes that might be punishment to correct them, but it's never going to be with an intent to just harm or to make them pay the penalty themselves. You cannot pay the penalty of your own transgression. Well, some things you can. It's like on a blackboard or a green board such as we have in college classrooms. You make a mark with chalk and you can erase it. But there are some things, some mistakes you make, you can't ever erase. If you should murder or kill a man, you can't bring him back to life. Some sins cannot be corrected. If you steal or take from a man, you can give back, and the Bible tells you how much to give back. But overall, it is Christ who paid the penalty of our sins for us. God corrects us that we won't need his shed blood for other sins. But if we sin, we certainly will need it. But he punishes every son he loves. Now he says, you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. If we are clean in this church, it is through the word of God. If I am your leader, brethren, and you are all my children, directly or indirectly, in the Lord, if there is any reason why God might have called and chosen me, I can only think of one. It is because I have been willing to believe God. The thousands heard Jesus preach for three and a half years when he was on earth. Only 120 were still believing him after his crucifixion. It's a very, very rare thing to believe God. There are many churches, many religious organizations. They all follow a leader. Where did their leaders get what they preach and what they believe and what they teach? I know of none who got it directly from God. They all got it from other men, other people. They come up in a certain denomination. Many of them go to a seminary or a school of that denomination, and they just absorb whatever the men of that denomination teach them. I was challenged. I began to study the Bible. I found it said just the opposite of what I'd been taught. I had to begin to prove whether or not I could believe the Bible. I had to prove whether God exists, and I did prove that. And I have proved it to atheists and caused them to admit it. I proved that the Bible is the Word of God. In its original writings, we have translations. There are a few errors or mistakes in the King James translation or any other one translation. We have many translations to compare. We have many, many copies of the original thousands of copies, and it is possible to know exactly what is the truth. I found I didn't agree with God. I agreed to what I'd been taught in Sunday school and coming up in a Protestant denomination. And I found that if I was going to walk with Christ, I had to agree with him. And so I had to change what I believed and begin to believe what he says here. Jesus Christ in person taught the original apostles. Jesus is the Word of God in person. I read to you a while ago that he said only what the Father told him to say. Everything he said is precisely what the Father says. He and the Father are of one mind and in total, absolute agreement. The Bible is the same word in writing. The first apostles received their knowledge, their understanding of truth from the personal Word of God in person. He's not here in person now, he's in heaven as our high priest, but he's alive and he's the leader of this church. He is the head of this church. But he taught me through this word. I found I was wrong. I was wrong about this and that and the other thing again and again and again. And I had to be corrected and begin to believe what God said by Jesus Christ. That's what I've been trying now for the last 55 years or 54 years to teach you people and thousands of others like you. And it is the truth. And it is truth alone that makes sense, that explains humanity, explains the world and its conditions, explains why things are as they are, explains the evils and the problems and the troubles in the world that the world cannot understand. And the world too often is not willing to understand. Didn't mean to preach a sermon tonight, but I just felt I needed to make a comment or two as I go along on some of these things. Well, again, Jesus said, I am the vine and you are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, he bringeth forth much fruit. 
But without me, you can do nothing. Whatever has been done in this work in these last 54 years has not been done by me at all. It has been done by the living Jesus Christ. I've merely been an instrument that has been used. You may hear a beautiful violin number, but it isn't really the violin, it's the man who plays the violin that's giving you the music. The violin is his instrument, and I have only been an instrument. If ye abide with me, if ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. These things I command you, that you love one another. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If I had not come and spoken unto them, they had not had sin. But now they have no hope for their sin. Coming on to the 16th chapter, just a few little excerpts here. But now I go my way to him that sent me, and none of you ask of me, uh, whether goest thou? Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away, for if I go not away, the Comforter will not come under you, that is the Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ has been very busy for these 1950 years in heaven on his Father's throne as our High Priest, guiding this church for one thing in our lifetime. He has been guiding it. He built this college campus, the most beautiful in the United States or in the world. Another very beautiful one over in Big Sandy that will soon be restored. And the third very beautiful one that is now owned by a public utilities company and their pride and joy in Brigham Wood in England. And they're all the type that glorifies God, his kind of character, of stability, of beauty, and of the double type of character. Now I'd like to come on to Jesus' final prayer, a little of it. These words spoke Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, this is in chapter 17, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work that thou gavest me to do. I'd like to make a comment right there. He had finished the work God gave him to do. That is, gave him to do in his person as a human while he was on earth. And that is what he meant on the cross when he said, it is finished, just before his head dropped and he died. What was finished was the work God gave him to do. But he's had other work to do, and that's to guide us in the work that we have to do. And we're only instruments in his hands in doing it. I have glorified thee, he said to his father, on the earth. I have finished the work that thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou with thine own self with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Glorify thou me, he said. I didn't get that me in. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee. Holy Father, keep to thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are one, kept in the name of our Father God. That's why we are the Church of God, not the Church of Armstrong, or of Luther, or of Calvin, or of Wesley, that we may be one and united. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. The name of the church is very important. I kept in thy name those that thou gavest me. I have kept and none of them is lost but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And now come I to thee, and these things speak I in the world, that they may have my joy 
fulfilled in themselves. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, and that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. I think that that will suffice of just some of the things that Jesus said to his disciples on that night before he was taken by an angry mob and taken from one court to another and tried by the Jews and by the courts of Caesar's government until he was put to death and crucified. This church has been persecuted. I've been persecuted ever since I gave myself over to him and I expect to continue to be. I counted the cost. I knew what he said about persecution and it has happened and it will happen and we all need to be much in prayer. So I'll just give a prayer and then we'll sing a hymn and go out. Almighty God in heaven, I ask you to somehow impress the solemnity of this service and the meaning of some of these things on all of us who are here. I ask you to carry these things in the mind with all of these lovable brethren as they leave and then we will start now to rid our lives of sin. Now we're coming on to seven days of unleavened bread, putting sin out of our lives, as we shall now have put leaven out of our homes and out of our properties. Thank you, Almighty God, for this service. Thank you that you gave it to us and for what it means. Bless all of these people as they leave. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's turn to page number 22. Rise. Singing together to the I Lift My Soul from Psalm number 25. I'd like you to notice the last bar in the second measure that there is a cremata hold there. We will hold that note. Page number 22 to conclude the service.